There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir, they have the car stopped in 10 and branch microbiter. We still don't know who pulled the trigger. and welcome to Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon, 27-year veteran out of Manhattan North Homicide Squad. And with me tonight, my co-host and straight out of Brooklyn, retired NYPD detective, Phil Grimaldi. How you doing tonight, Phil? I'm doing pretty good, Billy. How you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, great guest tonight, Michael Vecchioni, yeah. former Brooklyn District Attorney, uh, author of numerous books. We'll talk a little bit about his book, but specifically... The book we're going to talk about tonight is uh, Homicide is My Business, and a uh, really interesting book. Uh, Jimmy Calandra is supposed to be here. I'm going to have to resend him uh, the email, but uh, Mike, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you very much, guys, and uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. The book uh, came out uh, last, um, I guess, last Tuesday, and um, I got good good vibes from it you know people have read it already believe it or not and told me that they uh, they really enjoy it so um so i'm, I'm doing well and um working hard because i'm i say i'm writing something else as as we speak quite frankly and um uh, so it keeps me busy you know i miss being it back. seems like you're always writing something uh yeah mike yeah. that's great I, this, I, this, know, this is a great this is a great insight into the mind of uh luigi the hitman i love it i love it mike I, I have to tell you guys, I have, you know, I was probably, um, I don't know, maybe I was in my fifth or sixth, maybe seventh year in a DA's office. But, you know, a lot of it was spent doing the stuff that you guys know about, you know, in criminal court and stuff like that. When I got to the Homicide Bureau, I, I quickly moved up in terms of being, you know, one of the senior people. And when when two detectives brought this guy into the into the office, <laughs> I was senior at that point, believe it or not. And, you know, my boss who was needed somebody to take on, take him on because he was going to be an informant. They, he was Italian. The uh, obviously Luigi from Sicily. I'm Italian, Italian American. And uh, my boss said to me, you know, this guy's Italian, you're Italian. He's yours. You know, so so that's how I how I got to uh, to meet him and um, quickly became um, became uh, I don't want to say friends because that's a little bit. Um, a little diff. That's I, we were not friends, but we we really hit it off. You know, we really hit it off. I guess talking about my background and um, kind of got him to the point of of being somewhat comfortable. Um, and he was with me. He was with two of our detectives from the DA's office. He had been with two detectives from uh, from the NYPD, but before that, he was with the FBI, who he did not care for at all. I mean, he did not care for them at all. And that's how I got him. That's how well, I got they him. They probably didn't get him as veal cutlet parmesan. There you go. <laughs> that's absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. But more importantly, more important, when he gave himself up, he walked into the ninth precinct in Manhattan and said, I want to talk to the FBI. They, uh, they took him somewhere and they told him that they would they would put his wife and kids in witness protection and they would make sure that they had agents guarding them and put him in uh, in some place to uh, make sure he was guarded and one of the first nights that he was with these guys he gets a call from his wife she says there's no agents here nobody here guarding us and i got to tell you fellas he told me that he went nuts in that room with the FBI agent. He said, I want, I, and he spoke with, with like this. So, you know, he was, a, he had the broken English and he said, I, I want to kill him, I want to strangle him. If that wasn't bad enough, a couple of nights later, he's in his, mo in his motel room. The FBI is in another room, uh, not in the same, you know, suite in an, in another, an entirely different room. And Luigi's there. He says, I get a knock on my door. He says, I open the door and there are two guys there standing there in suits and they just stare at me. They look at me, they stare at me, look me up and down and I close the door. He said, Mike, he said, I, 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 they, they knew where I was. I don't know how they knew where I was, but I was, I told those FBI guys, I got to get out of here. And, uh, and they had to move them. So, so those two little incidents really turned them off. And when he got to me, 
One of the only, first things he said after telling me that he was hungry, <laughs> and I'll tell you that in a second, was, are you going to take care of my family? And you and I said, don't worry. Wherever your family is now, we'll take care of them. And then I asked him if he was hungry, and he said yes. <laughs> and he told me, I think I, I think I say it in the book about, called it merde in what he was eating, which is shit in Italian. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I said, well, what do you want? Veal cutlet palm hero? and a beer. That was it, <laughs> fellas. All I had to do was give them. Now, Phil, do you know the queen down in? Um, sure. Uh, sure. Okay. That's yeah. where we got the veal cutlet Parmesan hero. And every time. Great came, restaurant. Great restaurant. A great restaurant. And Bill, yeah. I got to tell you, it was when I, when he walked in every day, when he was coming in to inform uh, on, on telling me the, you know, his stories, I had the veal cutlet palm waiting for him. So he was, <laughs> he was very happy. And, um, but See, no, that we, have, we, have wonders, we have this guy coming in late to class. If I was hey, just teaching him, like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> how are you? How are you? You got your homework, Jimmy? <laughs> how are you? Jimmy, you're upside down. There you well, go. Hey, how about he's, try, he's probably trying to flip it. Yeah, you know, good. I, I, I try to get through my laptop. I couldn't do it through my laptop. I have to do it on my phone. Okay. okay. Yeah. You okay. look good, though. You're all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you're you're good. good. Oh, good. How's everything? Hi, hey, Mike. How are you? Hi, Bill. I'm how you doing? Jimmy. I got yeah. I got that picture. So, <laughs> Ming, look at the guns on Jimmy. Yeah, oh, yeah that's uh, that's when he was pumping some iron. <laughs> how are you? Good. 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 How, how you doing, doing Jim? Good. Mike, how, how's the book coming out? So far, so good, Jimmy. Jimmy, good. thank you very much for um, you know for for pushing it as you have and. Um, it's been it's been terrific. It's been terrific so far. So you know, Mike, the guy, his name is Luigi Ronces Valley. Is that how yes. you pronounce it? So yes. Ronces Valley. Now he's a pretty simple guy, and the, the term you guys use for him is he's a zip because he comes from Sicily. Right. And they come to the United States and really to work for a family. And in this case, he was looking to work for the Bonanno family. Right. But he had, yes. I think before he left Sicily. He had done at least three or four hits. Oh, yeah. More than that, I believe. Yeah, more, more than, than that. that. Okay. He told me, he, it, you know, I found this out later on, but I always felt that when he was talking to me, he wasn't telling me everything that he, you know, everything that he knew. And, and I found later on, when you get into the book, you'll see that he saved some things because he was, he was really, um, he was, he was a, a guy who knew, how to get over on people at some point. And, and he was very good at, you know, at collecting for, for the bananas, et cetera. But, but he was a simple guy, Bill. Sim very simple. But I tell you, what he told me, which was, I don't know, kind of shocking at the time, um, was that he always wanted to be, uh, he always wanted to be a made man. He, that was his, his, goal in life. He said, you know, and then he tells Congress later on when he testifies in front of Reagan's at Reagan's commission on organized crime that, you know, the, the, the American boys want to be baseball players. I love that quote. Italian and Sicilian boys. All they want is mafia. And that was him. That was him. But he came from a very poor family. Um, he did really kind of very odd and, and menial jobs. And then one day he walks into a social club or a coffee shop, I should say, not a social club in, in Catania, where he was born and where he was raised. And he, he approaches the Don, the guy that was in charge in Catania, a guy named Rapisardi. He never told me his first name. He always called him Signore Rapisardi. And, um, and before he could get to Rapisardi, there was a guy there who stopped him and said, well, you know, what are you doing here? And he said, oh, I have to talk to the senora. Said, no, 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 you don't do that. He went back every day from that point on until he finally got to Rapisardi and talked to him, told him what he was about, what he wanted. And, um, and then Rapisardi started to like him and he took him in. He took him kind of into his, um, uh, into his little operation at, at that point. And, and it, ex and, and he gave him jobs that I'm sure you guys having, you know, touched in law enforcement know that, you know, you don't become uh, a made guy by uh, right away. As soon as you walk in, they give you, they give you the menial things to do collecting. Mike, know. can I stop you for one second? Yeah, quick? sure. 
Now, I know that Jimmy's here and he could probably relate to this. Now, what you said about American uh, boys want to grow up to be baseball players and Sic Sicilians want to grow up to be mobsters. Uh, did he ever talk about, because I know from myself growing up in the neighborhood, when we saw gangsters and wise guys in the neighborhood, it was like, wow, you know, new car, fancy clothes, jewelry, pretty girls, the whole bit. So did he talk about that, that he aspired to that because he saw that there was the, uh, you know, the money factor or that they had, uh, you know, they they were treated differently? Did he, did he talk Sic about any of that? In Sicily, you're talking about? Yes. Before, yes before ab he yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. He was... You know, he was dirt poor and um, and these guys, these guys lived high on a hog. You know, one of the things this guy he loved is he, he always commented about shoes. He always he always, you know, talked about having, you know, nice shoes. And and the guys that were, you know, the 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 bosses always had nice shoes, always dressed well. And he aspired to that. That was what his uh, his whole point was. And of course, they made money and he wanted to make money. Yeah. And um you know, and, and it took him a little bit of time before he was able to get into Rapisardi's, um, you know, confidence. And then he gives him his first hit. And the first hit was not even on a local hit. It, he had to go from Catania, which is on the eastern side of Sicily, to Milan to kill a guy who owed Rapisardi money. And uh, and he tells me the story about how he had to do it. And he had to, you know, he didn't, he, he was so... I don't want to say backward, but he was so um, uh, local is that he didn't really even know how to how to get to the ferry, how to you know get to Milan. He had to take the ferry from Catania across to around Naples, and then he had to take the train up to Milan. Here's a guy from this little dirt poor area of of Sicily. Now he's in Milan, and he and he has to figure out how to kill this guy who is who is a, a prominent figure, a businessman. Wow, and he does it. He does it. He's he was a smart guy who knew how to get around in his in this environment that he was now thrust into. Well, Mike, he, he was he was street smart. And one of the things that we always notice and um, uh, we, we interviewed uh, Sammy the Bull. We've watched a lot of Sammy the Bull's um, podcast. And it's that whole thing of that that honor. There's a certain honor, even though you're killing people, you know, and it's like uh, Sammy always says uh, that's Cosa Nostra. You know, yeah, and that's yeah. that's our thing, you know. And if someone does it outside La Cosa Nostra, and this guy Luigi Roncesvalli, he had the same sort of mentality. Absolutely, absolutely. He you called. Know. He said he wanted to always become a man of honor. That's what he called it. And um, and he, of course, that meant a made guy. That that didn't mean you know he was going to be some some schlub who was just right. doing work for these guys. He needed to be and. And, and guys, you know, I got to tell you that when he talked to me about the murders that he did over there in Sicily and Italy and here, he always said that the the people who he who died and I don't want to say he killed because I'll tell you about that in a second. The people who died, he said, all all deserved it. They were dishonorable people. They dishonored themselves by backing out of debts that they owed and other things like that. That's how he justified it. In his Absolutely. Own Absolutely. Yeah, and, Jimmy Colangelo, Jimmy Colangelo what you want, I just want you to comment on that. Comment uh, about the honor. I want Jimmy to comment on on that. I don't mean to interrupt, but I want him to comment on about growing up and seeing the wise guys that that what was attractive about it to you, Jim. But go ahead. No, I, 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 but Jim, before you go there, I want to just you to talk about the honor and being a stand up guy. Like what does that mean on the street? When, you know, people outside the criminal world may look at that as that's all bullshit, you know, honor among thieves. That's what people would say outside the criminal world. Well, you know what? There's some people who truly believe in this and they're giving their life to it. You know, a guy like Manny Madonna, Herbie Sperlin died in prison. So these guys really believe in this life. So you know what? They believe in this honor thing. Even, I mean, to me, now that I'm 53 years old, I think it's all a bunch of bullshit. You know, there ain't no honor in it. At all. I mean, you got to kill your best friend. <laughs> I mean, look, you, you could pop your friend, you could kill him, put a couple bullets in his head, but you know what? You can't testify against him. I mean, it's all a bunch of bullshit, you know? But uh, as far as the honor thing, it's really where you come from, I would say. Uh, you know, I came from Bensonhurst, so, you know, there was a big mafia exposure over there, the five families. So uh, it's something you believe in as a kid. You know, you're coming up, you are... Uh, 
look up to these guys and you want to become them. Like, uh, you know, Mike said in Sicily, they want to become gangsters. In uh, America, you want to become ball players. But it all depends on where you grow up. You know, I mean, if you grow up in New York, five boroughs, without a dad, most likely you're going to get into some kind of crime. You know, if you have some direction in your life, I think you're going to be okay. But you didn't really answer the honor question. The honor, look, the honor thing is, in, look, it's great to have, I mean, a group of friends and you could be uh, honorable to each other. You know, it, it's like, uh, it's, a, it's a dream. You know, you want to believe in it, but you know it's not true. You know, sooner or later, someone's going to backstab you. It's just the way it is. It's a treacherous life. You know, I don't think there's no honor in it personally. You know, they make you believe that there's honor. Uh, uh, your honor. Who, who are you honoring? The boss? I mean, does he honor you? I mean, he respects you because you're kicking up to him. You know, if you're giving me money every fucking, every month, you know what? Hey, you're a nice guy. I'm going to honor you too. Once that money stops coming in, he don't give a fuck about you. Hey, Bill, I, let me just add one thing to this. To this, uh, You know, the, the definition of honor is not that that we know and that we we you know we we have used and 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 it's common in in our you know in, in our part of society is different from the 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 definitions different with with a guy like like Ron Sisvalli. to him it was honorable to be taken in by these people who he looked up to and to do what these guys asked of him in a way that was um, that was successful. And, and that was the honor that he, he sought. And, and he felt that, um, that the culmination of that was becoming a made guy, you know, a made man in the, um, in the, in, in the, in the Sicilian mafia. So, so there's a little, it, it was, it was always hard for me to understand when he was talking about uh, being a man of honor, you know, we look at it and I say, well, how could a guy who, sh who kills people, be honorable. But in his mind, he was honorable because he was doing what was asked of him by the guys who he looked up to. And that to him was an honorable thing. In addition to that, the secondary part of it was that he felt that the people who he ultimately was, was causing uh, the end of their life to um, had done things that, that kind of were not honorable in the way that we know honor and that they, they didn't do the thing they if they borrowed money and didn't pay it back well that was a dishonorable thing if in in the first hit he did in america if somebody was was uh pimping out a young widow um in in america that was not an honorable thing to do so he he kill he would kill him but then he committed the honorable act by killing him that so the definition is the definition is different from the perspective of of diff, uh, and his perspective is different from the definition that we that we have. So I think oh, you're bringing you know, out a great point, Mike, because what a lot of people don't understand when you read uh, a book or you talk to uh, Jimmy Calandra or Sammy the Bull, when you're in that life, there's rules that they go by. Now, we know that Jimmy has said it. Sammy has said it. A lot of times the rules are broken. But in general, if you're in that life and you have that mindset, that's the way they think. So in in and I, maybe I'm going a little too far, but you might correct me. Maybe Luigi in his mind thought that, no, I have to have honor for these guys. And if you break a rule in this world, we're living in this organized crime world, you got to die. And that's okay. You know, that's part of the game that's and true. you should know better. That's precisely it. He does, he, he does a, a, a diamond district robbery later on in his career. And it was done with the, uh, the, under the auspices of the Gambino family, the Bonanno family, he did it himself, right? When it came time to split the diamonds up, they kind of basically sent them to Chicago him. saying, let the heat calm down. And then they almost killed him. They tried to kill him. He, he, he lucked out of being, uh, you know, assassinated. And then when he gets back into New York and he's looking for his piece of the, of the, of the uh, you know, the money after the diamonds were supposed to have been fenced, they gave him $30,000. That was it. He said, that was not the honorable thing to do. I did everything and look what they did to me. That was kind of the beginning of the end for him with this. And he recognized what these guys were. As Jimmy said, you know, they're, they're, they're now that, that stuff about, you know, doing what we say, 
is an honorable thing to do is total bullshit. It really, and Luigi started to recognize that. And, and we write that the real honor was when he recognized that and decided to come in from the cold, so to speak, and to tell us about what he was doing so that we could bring bad guys to justice. That was, that was really what ultimately, uh, that's when he really became a man of honor in my mind. Um, so, so he, he, Constantly, as you read the book, the murders that I talk about all have to do with people who have done things to other people and bad things to other people. And they, in his mind, deserve to deserve to die. The other part of this, guys, I just want to say is that he maintained, believe it or not, straight face to me, to Congress and maybe even at the Pizza Connection trial when he testified that he never killed anybody. He was not responsible for killing these people. The person who paid him the money to do the assassination, that guy was responsible for uh, for the murders. And that was his, the way that he thought. So he had, you know, he obviously had a different way of thinking than than we do. But that's his that was his mentality. So based on that, Mike, I think that it sounds like. He really believed in it at the start. He believed in uh, La Cosa Nostra, organized crime, that these guys were going to look out for him and he was going to do work and he was going to be rewarded for it. And then as he went along, he realized that it was just a cutthroat thing that Absolutely. set up that jewelry store. That whoever set up the jewelry jewelry robbery that, with the diamonds, then they try to kill him. That must have been the red flag or the light went off in his head that, hey, they're not playing by the rules. Absolutely. And there's what, you know, it, he, he didn't really kind of let it – take hold early on because Bill was talking before about this guy set him up at this robbery of this, of this uh, 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 drug store. And, and they were supposed to go there as partners. And when they get there, the, the partner says to him, okay, you go in and here's a gun, go in, rob the guy because they were supposed to be collecting the robbery proceeds were going to be money to pay back some, one of the bosses on Knickerbocker Avenue for money that the drugstore owner owed him. So Luigi walks in, pulls his gun out, announces a robbery, and the drugstore, uh, the druggist, reaches under the counter and pulls out a gun and starts shooting at Luigi. And he says to me, these are lucky that there's a bad shot because he missed me. Otherwise, I'm dead. He runs outside waiting to get, run, to get into the car that drove him there, and the guy had taken off. Not because of the shooting. As soon as Luigi went in, the guy took off. He was setting him up. He set him up because he felt that Luigi was going to start cutting into his business because he was he he Luigi was being you know was taken was being taken in more and more by the by the people on Knickerbocker Avenue and trusted uh, and this guy felt that he was going to uh, you know cut into his business so he set him up Luigi told me he said I I want to kill him right as soon as I got back to Knickerbocker Avenue and of course they had to sit down couldn't kill him and the guy. <laughs> The guy paid him. The guy gave him half of what they would have gotten if they had really robbed the uh, the, the the drugstore. And he said, "You believe this? He's gonna kill me." He, and it took him a long time for him to 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 get over that. That was see, those were the things that really kind of hurt him more than anything else. That was a an a dishonorable act, and it, and it's a dishonorable act for us as well. But that was a dishonorable act to him. And he needed to uh, he needed to write it in his mind. But the bosses on Knickerbocker Avenue wouldn't let him do it. So um, but he became he then became, quite frankly, very successful with this. Jimmy, guy. did you ever have a point in your life where someone uh, double crossed you that you realized, wow, this isn't what everybody told me it was going to be or what you thought it was going to be? Sure. A couple of times in my life, you know, you, look, as you walk in the streets, you know, you are uh, <clears throat> you run into a lot of characters of life. Some of these wise guys are actually good guys. You know, some of these wise guys are really bad guys. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, once you realize that, uh, you know, who you're dealing with, uh, it's time to, uh, you know, look around you, you know, who's around me, you know, who can I trust? You really can't trust too many people. You know, there might be one or two of them, but you, the rest you can't, you know, I mean, well, Jimmy, not- Jimmy, in the beginning of your show, you say, you love the streets, but the streets will never love you back. And we used to say the same thing about the police department. 
Yeah. You love being a cop. You love being the police department, but the police department does not love you back. (laughs) You know what? Look, wise guys and police officers have a lot of things in common. Okay. I mean, yeah, no, I have a lot of things in common because, I mean, you take an oath, you know, to uh, protect and serve the community. And uh, you know what? They take an oath to, you know, to form, you know, this group in the family an organization. So, uh, you know, you abide by that oath. And, uh, you know, at the end of your career, you realize that some of these police officers that got your back, you realize that they're a bunch of scumbags, right? I mean... Yeah, some of them... uh, Some some of them didn't have your back. Unfortunately, this is what we realize, and it goes for friends, too. I've been disappointed in my life a lot. You know, I try to stay away from people. I really do. My company is very small because people disappoint me. Absolutely. Yeah. Disappointment was one of the big things in Luigi's life in terms of his, the, the life that he thought this was, the life that he thought this was turned out not to be the life it was at all. He was disappointed in a lot of situations. Um, and, um, and, and some of them, some of them like the, the, the diamond uh, robbery. And when he was in Chicago uh, at, hiding out, so to speak, that was the, that was, uh, you know, the most, it was it was a, it was treacherous what they did to him, and he was more than disappointed. He really wanted to just come back and and kind of kill everybody who had anything to do with it. Um, but he was stopped. And here's the other part that's kind of a, a really a, a difficult to understand, in my opinion, is that he he was disappointed by these guys. Disappoint, and then the bosses didn't back him up, so he he could kind of. Uh, uh, you know, seek justice and get it the way he wanted. Um, and then, you know, they kind of, they kind of just let it go. I mean, he, he was so, he was so enamored with these guys and, and would do anything to, to, for them. And then when he was hurt or at least attempted to be hurt and in this case, attempted to be killed, they didn't even kind of, you know, they didn't back him up. They, he, he got $30,000 from the, uh, you know, for the, for the, for the robbery. And that was it. Um, so that was a, that was a major, that was a major disappointment. And there were others, you know, there were others in that he talks about. And I talk about him in the book where he was, he was disappointed. Things didn't go the way he thought they were going to go. And it was basically these, the bosses who, you know, kind of sat and, 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 you know, tra- tamped things down and said, listen, no, 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 you can't do what you want to do. And that was really disappointing to him, really disappointing to him. At the, let me just tell you, finish to tell you about the robbery. So when he comes back to New York, there's a whole sit down because he says, I'm killing. I'm going to kill. He, he knew who it was. It was a guy named Enzo Napoli who he wanted to kill. Enzo Napoli was a guy who was supposed to be the liaison between the Sicilian mafia and the American mafia. And he was a fence also. And he was going to fence the diamonds. Enzo didn't like Luigi. And he, that's why he sent a hit team out to Chicago to kill him. And, um, and when Luigi came back, it's the first thing he want, he went to with bosses on Nickabaca Avenue and said, I want to kill Enzo Napoli. That was it. They said, no, 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 you, there's going to be a, a, a sit down. He goes to the sit down in this restaurant in Manhattan. And, um, there's all these people around the table, people from the Gambinos, people from, from, uh, his, his family and they, and, and Napoli is there. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry. You know, they don't talk about the, the hit in Chicago. That's like it didn't even happen. Luigi, all that's all he wants to do is talk about it. In fact, he would have killed him if he if he could have right there. So they they calm him down. They cut they cut them. They they div- start dividing all the diamonds up. There's over a million dollars worth of diamonds, and we're talking about now back in the you know the, the late '60s, early '70s. That's a lot of money back then. And, and he doesn't get a dime. He gets no diamond. There's one left. And he says, you know, I, I guess that was the that was going to be mine. And he says, a guy walked into the restaurant. Everybody at the table looked up at him. It turned out to be it was Paul Castellano. He sits down, the boss of the Gambino family. He sits down at the table. And they think that, you know, that God has sat down. And they hand him this big, huge diamond. Castellano has nothing to do with anything except he was the boss and part of this hit crew was Gambino. He said, I said, so what did he do? What happened? He says he got up and he left the restaurant with the diamond. He says, Mike, I was screwed. He said, I gave me $30,000. That's it. 
he, so that was another example of how he was how he was let down by these guys. And then the ultimate letdown is the end of, is why he comes into us because he 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 was seeking he wanted bail money to get out of the country basically because he didn't want to have to give up this guy that he was working for or the guy that, that had 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 approached him to kill a prosecutor and a judge. This guy said uh, uh, Michele Sindona. He didn't want to have to talk about Sindona. He just didn't want to kill a prosecutor. And he certainly didn't want to go to Italy and kill a judge. Sindona wanted both of them killed because they were going to they were going to prosecute him. So when he calls Sindona after he gets arrested and says, give me five hundred dollars to get out of bail, Sindona says, no, no, because you didn't want to kill these people like I wanted you to. He says, no. So Luigi warned him. He said, OK, he gets his brother in law to put up the five hundred. He gets out of jail. And he calls Sindona. First thing he says, he says, I, I, I I'm going to talk. If you don't get on, if you don't let me get out of here, I'm going to talk. I need $30,000 to get out of the country. Sindona basically ignores him. Doesn't say anything. He says, okay, basically it's, and I'm sorry to use this language, but fuck me. No, fuck you. That's what he said to him. And what did he do? He walks into the ninth precinct in Manhattan and he says, I want to talk to the FBI. That's how, this whole thing started. That's how I got him because the FBI was done with him. He went to the, they gave him to the PD, the, the, the six, eight and the 11th homicide zone were done with him. But the, and the, but the new corners, another hit that he did in the restaurant in Dyka Heights, Phil, is that where it is? Yeah, Dyka Heights? yeah, exactly. It's a t- t- that's open and in Bay Ridge and Dyka Heights. It, yeah. it recently closed. I would say within the last six months or a year yeah. it closed. And who's well, they, going lost to their, they lost their cook. Yeah. <laughs> Who's got that case? Me. So so I now have this guy telling me why he did it. And it's another murder for honor. The cook was raping his own niece and the family found out about it. They went to the Gambinos. The Gambinos went and they knew about they knew about Luigi and how successful he was as a hitman. And they went to, you know, Knickerbocker Avenue and or made the call and Luigi Shows up. Now, I gotta tell you a funny story about this. They had hired another guy. The Gambinos had 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 given the contract to kill this guy, the chef, to another another hitman. First, so he shows up at the restaurant when the first night he shows up. Outside is are several police cars. Now, I think, Phil, that that was a place where cops ate sometimes, right? Yes. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Very correct. The hitman gets cold feet. He gets back in his car and he takes off. He goes back to his bosses and says, too many, too many cops. They said, really? Okay. Well, they went to Luigi. Now, I don't know what happened to that guy, but they went to Luigi and he, he methodically, methodically set it up. He called, he went, he, he, the guy was not around. He was in Sicily, by the way. This and, is great uh, story. Yeah. And they finally, you know, they finally, he finally calls one day. And he says, Enzo, Enzo there. And he says, yeah, Enzo, he here. So Luigi has to get the girl who he was raping in the car, drive to the location, because Luigi doesn't know what this guy looks like from a hole in the wall. And they sit outside the restaurant. Enzo comes to, to work at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. She says, that's him. Later that night, he figures, he says, calls again, Enzo there, he's in the kitchen. He gets there, he walks into the back, and he describes this to me in this broken English. I say, I walk in, I see all these people. He say, Enzo, where Enzo? Enzo, he here. Yeah, Enzo's over there. He's over there. He's over there. He walks over to the guy, and he just puts a bullet in his head. That's it. Guy falls down. He shoots him again. He walks out, gets in the car. It was driven by a guy whose name I can't remember, but it was a Gambino guy, and he gives him the gun. He tells him to get rid of it. The, he finds out much later on that the guy never got rid of the gun. So he he, he knew that ultimately that gun was going to come back to haunt him. And that's why I wanted him to get rid of it. He doesn't do it. And uh, and that's the open homicide that I have. And uh, that's why this the the guys from the from the 11th homicide zone in the 6-8 walk him into the DA's office. And I think it was, you know, they didn't at that time, Phil, tell me if I'm wrong. Did they have did people set up to 
to, to do this kind of stuff or watching this guy and set him up in witness protection or, or sit on him for, for days or for weeks or for no. Right. I mean, that, not really o- only, only in like a super high profile case, like right. when Tommy karate got, got pinched. They had guys from all the different squads taking turns, uh, guard witnesses and stuff like that. They had the dig out in Staten Island. Guys would go to that only on super high profile things. But for right. most part, the DA's office really handled that. It. And that you hit it right on the head. That's why they came into us because right. we would take over and they, and we did. And then mm-hmm. that's how, you know, how I got to, uh, to meet the guy. But, um, but the, the whole idea of, um, you know, the honor and wanting to be, you know, and, and Phil, to go back to your question. You asked about whether or not, you know, the, the, the suits and the money and stuff like that kind of enticed them. Yeah, it did. It did. I'm not going to lie. And when he came to America and he had to he had to get to Knickerbocker Avenue, where his buddy, where his boss in Sicily told him to go because they were looking for, for looking for Sicilians. And that was because the Carmine Galante and Joe Bonanno had set up this this this, um, you know, this connection to a drug connection that they knew was going to piss off a lot of the other families because they were making so much money and they weren't sharing it. They needed, they needed people. They needed guns. They needed guys to, to protect them. And they were importing the zips from Sicily. And, and the whole thing about the zip was, is a derogatory term from by American mafia guys uh, for the, for the Sicilians. That's not a, you know, that was, that was not something that, they knew in Sicily and Luigi was absolutely terrible. Was, he was so upset when he, when they, when they referred to him as a zip, he, cause he knew that it was a derogatory term. So when, you know, so he, 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 I'll get back to what I know. I was lost my train of thought for a second. So he, he has to go now and find someone to who's the boss. He finds out the boss, is a, is a guy named Pino DeQuana. That's who he has to look for on Knickerbocker Avenue. And he knows he's that's got- a That's in the U.S. you're talking about. In the U.S., yeah. He, he, he's told to go and meet this guy, DeQuana. DeQuana is the guy that he needs to meet. DeQuana was kind of like the number two guy to another guy named Peter Lakata. He was the, the boss of Knickerbocker Avenue. And, um, and Knickerbocker Avenue was kind of the central location for the Bananos in Brooklyn at that, at that time. So he goes into his social club that he knows is the Quanta social club. And he, and I said, well, did you know, did you know what he looked like? No, but I see, he says, I see a guy dressed in a beautiful suit, a beautiful tie. And this is where the shoes come in. He had these nice, shiny, beautiful shoes. And he's sitting reading the, the Italian newspaper and he's having, I think he had, he said, tell me either a, a it wasn't a Sambuca. It was something else. Maybe, may have been just espresso. And he said, and he, and he said, I knew. He says, I knew that that was the guy I had to speak to. And much like with Rapisardi, when he approached him, he approached Daquana, and Daquana said, looks up at him and says, basically, who, who are you? Basically, says, you know, get lost. He says to him, my, you know, my Signor Rapisardi in, in Catania sent me to see you. Ultimately. He, he, he makes his way into Daquana's, um, you know, confidence, et cetera. But it was the way that Daquana looked, Phil, that that knew that told uh, Luigi, this is the guy that I have to see. And he was right. He was right. And he always he said he always dressed to the nines. That's the way it was. And he he was, um, you know, and he when I was to- a kid growing up on Avenue U. 12 o'clock in the day, these guys were dressed like they were going to a wedding, so to Correct. speak. You know, fancy clothes. Jimmy, I'm sure you uh, – oh, Jimmy's – I think Jimmy's mu- – uh, mic is muted. But uh, your mic is muted, Jim. But uh, we would see these guys around the avenue with the fancy cars. They came – they would come out, you know, uh, 12 o'clock, 11, 12 o'clock, and they would be dressed like they were going to, uh, you know, yep. to a show or something, you know, and and the jewelry and the whole thing. And they had the, you know, there, there were a couple of guys I can remember that had the air about them that there was one guy uh, and I happen to, I, you know, Jimmy said, and Tommy Dades always says this, there was good, bad guys and was bad, uh, bad guys. This guy was a good, bad guy. Angelo Defenders was a boxer and I knew him from Avenue. And when I would see Angelo, you know, you wouldn't even, as a kid, you wouldn't even look 
right in his eyes. Like you, you know, he was, he was a menacing figure. Turned out later on in life, I, I met him when he was kind of retired before he passed away. And he turned out he was an honorable guy. He was a good guy, you know, gambling, whatever he was in. He won a uh, golden gloves and stuff like that. Tommy had uh, met him many times to a fights and stuff, but he had a brand new Cadillac that when he drove yeah. around his Cadillac, yeah. the car was never dirty. The car was always mint. It was a 66 Caddy. Everybody in the neighborhood knew it. That's because so you, you, you were washing it. Huh? <laughs> That's because you were washing it. <laughs> no, not me, but there was somebody washing it. That's for when, sure. When, when Go Luigi, get your shine box, right? <laughs> when Luigi got involved in the pizza connection, tra uh, you know, uh, uh, transporting dope all over the, all over the country, one of the places that he does that he has to go to is Miami. And he's told, go to Miami, fly down to Miami tonight. No, tomorrow morning. He, this is the night before he's told to fly down to Miami, go to Collins Avenue and and, and particular street. I'm not sure. The, the I don't remember the, the side street. You're going to meet. Um, he was he was doing uh, his partner at the time was a guy named Felice Puma, who was a, another one of these transporters all over the country with with dope. He said, you meet Puma. What, what am I going for? Uh, don't worry. When you get down there, you'll know. So he goes, he's waiting. Puma pulls up, and this is, to your point, in a Porsche, a beautiful, brand, basically brand new Porsche. He sees him. Puma calls him, tells him, get in, gets into the front seat, and Puma hands him a shotgun, and he says it was a Lupara, which is the one that he was used to using in, in Sicily, and he's got a handgun. And he sits, he says, what, what, what do I need this for? He said, <laughs> Puma tells him that the back area of the Porsche, I guess it was the trunk. I didn't know a Porsche had a trunk, but maybe they did, the one he had, was completely filled with heroin, total. And later on, a, a senator in, in Congress asks him, why did you have the, the shotgun? And he says, what was I supposed to have, a, a pea shooter? He said, I had a I had a, 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 a trunk full of heroin and I have to go from Miami to Brooklyn. And here's the thing, guys. I don't understand how. I mean, this guy had to be the luckiest man in the world. They drove all the way from Miami in his red Porsche all the way up to Brooklyn. Never, never stopped once by a highway patrol officer, a state police officer, a cop. Never all the way up and back without ever being being stopped. I he found that obeyed you know, the speed limit, I guess, because maybe they, they did. Maybe they did. Along the way, where they pull yep. you over, you go one mile over, they're getting you. Yeah, you know, you go through to some of those states like South Carolina, North Carolina. They stop with a with a New York license plate. You Delaware, know, I mean, that's, yeah, Maryland. That's Delaware. like a yeah. that that's you know that's that they grab him in a second. He made it all the way back. Yeah. He, you know, I, the guy for the most part until the end, he was really kind of. Living the house, not the highlight, but he was lucky. He got he got through and did things and so many things and never once, never once got caught. Never once. The only time he got caught was at the end when he got bad information. He was he, he was kind of on the outs with Sindona. He needed money and he found out about a courier that was delivering money every every I think it was every Tuesday, every Wednesday, whatever it was. Um, and it was generally about $30,000 pick up and deliver, pick up and deliver. And it was in Queens. And sure enough, they go to the spot, they sit there and there it is the courier with the bag of money. And Luigi looks closely and he says, it was a woman. He said, I know, I know can rob no woman. I know. Said, rob I, can't a rob woman. A woman. <laughs> I, nobody in Sicily, nobody robs a woman. I don't kill no wife and no kids. <laughs> Remember Scarface? Yes. yes. But, he, but, he, so, but he does it. He does it. And that kind of also leads him to the whole thing with Sindona about getting the money. He said, because if I have to ever say that on the stand that I rob a woman or somebody here in open court that I rob a woman, I couldn't. He, this is what he said to me. I could never look at my family. I could never. My, I couldn't. I could, my, he, he meant his real family. So he, um, that's how, you know, that's how this whole thing goes down. It's the only time that he, and he get, I don't know how they, he must've been, it must've been broad daylight because as soon as they got back into the car, he gets back into the car, 
They drive to the 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 uh, wheel man's home where they're going to split the money up. Uh, by the way, it was supposed to be like thirty, forty thousand dollars. It was three thousand dollars in the bag. That's another mm-hmm. thing that really pissed them off. And they get in front of this guy's house. A ton of squad cars now come. Surround them, take him out, and he gets arrested. Somebody must have dropped a dime. Yeah, somebody, mm-hmm. and and um, and that was what that's what started him on this whole thing with the um, you know the five hundred from Sedona, and then then ultimately led him to walking into the ninth precinct to uh, you know to to give it up. So, folks, this um, is a police off the cuff real crime stories. If you're not subscribed to our channel, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up. It's free to subscribe. We don't charge you anything. We also have a Patreon with three different levels, and those folks that belong to our Patreon do pay a monthly fee, and we really uh, respect and adore these people. We also have a YouTube channel memberships, and you see the folks in the chat in the green font. They're uh, part of our channel members, and they support us. They help keep this uh, this channel alive. Phil, want, want to do this quickly? Sure. Joe Murray, attorney at law. Have you found yourself in a jam? Are you in need of legal counsel in the New York area? Do you need a victim's advocate? Well, Joe Murray is your man. He's not only an experienced trial attorney, he's also a retired 15-year member of the NYPD. He literally knows both sides of the fence. His website is jmurray-law.com. His telephone number is 646 838 one seven zero two, or you could email Joe at Joe at jmurray lawcom Joe is a great friend and a big supporter of Police Off the Cuff, as well as we have Jimmy Calandra tonight, who also has a podcast called Jimmy Calandra, Jimmy Calandra, a bad day in your story. Any of our subscribers, you want to check him out, give him a thumbs up and subscribe to him as well. And uh, Jim, uh, you remember New Corners Restaurant? Uh, Mike was talking about New Corners. You, would you have eat that, uh, Jim? Yeah, yeah, I remember it. And also, you brought up a point before. You said there was a very fine line between cops and gangsters. And I could remember being a Brooklyn cop. You know, I was single for a lot of years before I uh, I got married, like in 98. But I was single a lot of years, and we would go out partying. And I can remember pastels. I'm sure you know pastels, Jimmy. Uh, Mike, you might know it as yeah, well. I, I do. It. Uh, I'm not sure if Bill knows it. I think, you know, Long Island and, and he was Manhattan, so he might not know it. But we would be on one side of the bar. When I say we, it would be me. We used to call it, a, we would do a four to four. You go in for a four to 12. After work, you go out drinking, go to a club, go partying, and it would be till 4 a.m. So we were doing a four to four, and it would be like guys from my, my precinct or my squad and, and guys from other precincts. We would all be on one side, and wise guys and gangsters would be on the other. We didn't bother them. They didn't bother us. They knew who we were. We knew who they were. A lot of times they'd try to buy us drinks and stuff and things like that. But we always respected one another. Like, you guys do your thing. We're going to do our thing. And as long as they didn't fuck with us and playing English, we didn't fuck with them. But there really was a fine line uh, in a lot of respects, like Jimmy said, where, you know, they took an oath to do organized crime. We took an oath to protect and serve. Peter let me, Pranzo, let me tell you, Lieutenant Peter Pranzo, Harlem Raiders, and there is the rub. Oh, Organized right. crime families were bringing in heroin from overseas and using all the young Harlemites to sell the poison, killing thousands. No honor there. That's from Lieutenant Pete from uh, Harlem Raiders. There was there was no honor in, in what Luigi was doing by transporting ha- kilos of heroin across the country and to to, to Chicago and to Miami and to, uh, you know, it, it was, there was no honor in that at all. And he, and he admitted it. He said that was, you know, something that was, he had to do, but he didn't, uh, that was not his, his thing. But can I go back to you? Know, you guys are talking about cops and, and, and the wise guys and, and the, the fine line. I, I told this story when, when I was on Jimmy's show uh, last week, and I, I think it, it kind of, it, it shows how close it could be. They, they, they are. Um, Luigi gets hired to kill this uh, businessman in uh, in New Jersey, and uh, and and the backstory to it is that um, the the wife of this businessman gives her brother a call after her husband, the businessman, had played poker the night before and and lost. Um, this this huge pot that he was hoping to win to get kind of back even in this game. Guy was a gambler, and uh, he was he was gambling with friends, but it was a, a, a weekly thing, and the pot was a big one. 
he didn't have enough money to stay in the game, but he had a great, he felt a great hand. So what he does to stay in the game is he puts his wife up as the ante in the, in the, in, as in the pot and he loses. And the deal was that he had to take the other two, the other three guys home with him and they raped his wife for the entire evening, the whole night. And, um, and he said to her, listen, you got to do it. Otherwise they're going to kill me. And um, the next morning, she calls her brother, who happened to be a Newark, New Jersey police officer. And um, he knows what he wants done. And he, where does he go? He goes to Knickerbocker Avenue. Why? Because Pino DeQuana and he, this cop, grew up together or were friends as kids in Sicily. And um, Pino says that you don't have to basically say nothing. I, I know what, to, what needs to be done. And, um, and he, he gets Luigi. And Luigi, tell, I said to Luigi, how much did you make for this? He goes, only $4,000. He says, I said, why? Because he said to me, because this guy deserved to die. This is one of those honor killings. But the cop and the, and the cop came to Brooklyn to do this because of Dequana and he knew him. But also, he didn't go to the De Cavalcanti family in Jersey. He didn't go to any any mobsters he knew in Jersey, and he did. I think because he felt that you know that <laughs> it was too close to home, and and that you know if he showed himself that way, if one of these guys would get into trouble at some point down the road in Jersey, then they'd give up a newer cop and you know and 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 get out from under their problem. He felt safe in Brooklyn. And um, and he came to Dequana and Dequana did it and paid Luigi. I'm sorry, not paid him. He 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 hired. He, he gave him the hit, gave him the contract, and Luigi did what he always did, which is to kind of not. I don't want to say stalk, but he did surveillance. And you guys who are cops can know that know how important surveillance is to figure out how it, when a guy leaves for work, where he works, where he lives. What does he do with his day? You know, that kind of stuff. And Luigi did all of that. Routine. And there were a couple of times where he felt that this was a, you know, a good time to, to kill him, but it turned out not to be. And then he finally waits for a, uh, a Saturday. Uh, I'm sorry, a Friday. It was a Friday morning. And he knew that at this point it was quiet and this is when he was going to do it. And, uh, and the guy came out of his house <laughs> instead of going to work, which is where he was going to do this. He, it was, he was dressed as, in his fishing gear. He was going fishing. And Luigi said, I said, so what'd you do? He said, I stepped out from the side of my car. I was across the street from him. He turned around and I shot him. I got him right in the head, one shot. And I, I laughed when I heard it, not because it was it was funny, but I said, one shot? You want me to believe that you got him with one shot? He says, I'm a good shot to Mike. I'm a good shot. I, I got him and that was it. What he did next, get in his car. He had to figure out before, because he didn't know Jersey. He had to figure out how he gets to the Garden State Parkway because he liked to go to Atlantic City after the hits and gamble because he was a big gambler and uh, drink. He was also a womanizer. You know, he would be able to do all of that stuff four or five days. Then he would come back to Brooklyn and resume his life. But Mike, I, in, in that story, what happened to the wife? I don't know what happened to anybody after that because Luigi doesn't know and didn't know. And I tried, we tried to, to figure out who this guy was, what the name of it was. We called Jersey. I believe that it happened because it's nobody could make a story up like this, but I don't know what happened to, um, I don't know what happened to the wife. I don't. Did um, you ever I, connect the homicide to, to Luigi or no? No, nope, nope, only by him. He connected it for us. Right. He right. gave that up because I, I asked him about, you know, things that he had done to tell me about, about his, uh, what he had done. And I, I wanted to know what he did in the United States and in, in the metropolitan area. You know, I knew what he had, he told me what he had done in Sicily, but I didn't know what he had. And he told the FBI what he had done in Sicily. And he told the FBI the things that he had done here in the United States, but I wanted more detail. And I said to him, you got to tell me more that you did. And he tells me, I, I, I tell you about, he never asked questions as to what the guy's name was. He didn't know the cop's name. The cop and and after he killed this this the brother-in-law, 
the cop came to Knickerbocker Avenue and met Luigi at the Qantas Club, and he paid him the four thousand dollars at the club. But he never asked what his name was. He I, and he couldn't tell me where in Jersey he was. He just he he said I I knew I don't know no names. I know where he was because I followed him, and that's how he he got to um, he got to know him. But the idea of of giving your putting your wife up in a pot in a in a Second. poker pot, Luigi Second. was he was he would have killed him for nothing. He told me he would have done it for nothing because of, first of all, because of the Quana and they were, and they were friends, you know, that was the Quana's, um, the Quana's, I guess the Quana grew up with the cop and his, and his, and the uh, sister who was the, the wife of this, of this guy. They grew up in, in, in Sicily, came to the United States and they lost contact. These people went to the Jersey. He went to, uh, went to Brooklyn. So, um, I would have to say that he was very proud. Luigi was very proud of that hit because of, um, of, of the reason, because of the, you know, what the guy had done and um, he, he deserved to die in his, in his uh, estimation. So, um, but it kind of hits home with the idea that the wise guy went to a, um, the cop went to a wise guy in order to, you know, to take care of this, uh, of his brother-in-law. And um, it may be <laughs> that that happens, you know, more often than we like to, we'd like to know, but um, there is a, uh, I believe, Phil, you're right. There is a fine line between the wise guys and, and the cops. And, um, you know. You know what? That cop probably had in his mind that he wanted to exact revenge, obviously. I mean, th the guy was a scumbag. To no do doubt. To his wife and, and allowed three guys to rape his wife. I mean, horrendous. But he probably said to himself, he's close to it. Maybe they could figure it out. He didn't want to use wise guys that he knew from the neighborhood. Precisely. He, w he went to uh, somebody that he could trust, I guess, because he grew up with... Uh, with the, with the gentleman you said in, in Sicily. So, well, you know, um, when, when you, when you read the book, you'll see that there was a, a problem also, not a problem, but a, the De Cavalcanti family in Jersey was under investigation at that time. And it came out right, it was, that there were, that there were tap wiretaps and, and a lot of the, a lot of the wiretaps were made public. So I believe that the cop knowing that the De Cavalcantes were, you know, were, were not, they, I don't think he could trust them. Because of, you know, the fact that that they were under the microscope and that I believe that, you know, the, giving up a cop for a murder would get a guy, you know, uh, if not a, a, a totally out of jail, would certainly get get a reduced sentence out of the guy. But but it was um, but I, I brought that up because of what you talked about in terms of the relationship between, you know, cops and, and, and wise guys and the fine line. But it also is another example of the honor killing. You know, he, he it was. That was what he um, that was what he did. And, and the first, you know, the first one, the one that really he made his his bones, so to speak, in Brooklyn was also similar to this. Um, but in, in that situation, it was a wise guy who was was pimping out the widow of one of their friends. And the other wise guys couldn't kill him because he was their friend and and they didn't want to. And Luigi heard all about this. He was dealing cards in an illegal casino one night. He heard the story and uh, he said, I'll do it. And he told me this is the way he was going to make. He needed to do something to precipitate getting made and the, you know, collecting debt and collecting, you know, loan shark money. That wasn't going to do it for him. And he, he, he took this contract and he did the same thing that he always did. He stalked the guy, surveilled the guy, and then finally killed him. And he this did is his, he part. did his thing. He did his thing. He knew he how to went, do it. He did it well. Is, it was, and then he went to Atlantic City. There was no gambling down there. Then this is before gamble gambling. He came back. When he came back, I said, "What? What? What did they say?" He said, "I was a hero because the family of this young woman had gone to the Bananos to tell them about what was happening." And now Luigi was, you know, he had taken care of business and he was, he was a hero among the people who, um, who he now had to, who he was living with at this point, you know, in terms of his business. So, um, so he, you know, in, in a, uh, in a different setting, this guy would have been looked upon as, you know, kind of like a, a Robin Hood character, you know, going right. after the robbing the rich to pay the poor, but he was killing the bad guys in order to, uh, to get rid of, to, to take care of, the family of the good, this good woman who was, 
who is being, uh, you know, being exploited by this, uh, by this one of their own, you know? So Guys, the, the, book, the book is Homicide is My Business. Luigi the Zip by Michael Vecchioni and Jerry Schmetterer. Uh, Mike also has a book out called Crooked Brooklyn, also by with Michael Vecchioni and Jerry Schmetterer. Yep. And this one here, Friends of the Family, which exposes the mafia cops, Louis Ippolito and Stephen Caracappa. This is a, a fantastic book. Uh, really, they should make this, this book, Friends of the Family, into a movie. It's just a great story that uh, oh, people are... Yeah. People won't believe until they read the book, you know. Yeah, we're closer. Yeah. We're closer than we have almost ever been in terms of what you just said, Bill. Something, something's percolating. So I, I mean, we're not. I'm not in position. About time, and it, but, and yeah. in memory of Joe Ponzi as well. It's about time, and yeah. I just hope it it comes out and it works out. Yeah. But real quick about you were talking about. We were talking about uh, the mutual respect, so to speak, with uh, with the fine line of cops. For my years of growing up in Gravesend, I rubbed elbows with a lot of wise guys, and for the most part, most of them, their opinion of the cops were, "Hey, they're doing their job. We're doing our thing." There were some, you know, the wild card guys that. They hated cops. Cops were scumbags and all of that. But for the most part, I mean, I can remember Tommy Dades bringing in Billy Cotullo, who was a, a heavy-duty captain in the Colombo crime family. And it was like they were just – the whole situation was so friendly. Uh, he locked up the whole club. And, you know, the guys came in. They were like gentlemen. They sat down. There was no uh, no arguing, fighting. It was full cooperation. And it was like a gentleman's thing. It was an agreement that, hey, we got respect for you guys. You guys have respect for us. We're doing what we have to do. And everything went along fine. Occasionally, you know, Jimmy, uh, what was the general um, atmosphere when you guys were on Bat Avenue when the cops were around? Was there any kind of mutual respect with the cops? No. Growing up, I didn't like cops. <laughs> I, I could figure that. I could figure that. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> growing up, I didn't like cops. There was maybe one or two cops in the neighborhood. There was this guy, uh, Frank the Cop in the 6'2". He used to walk the beat. He used to stop on my stoop, talk to my mother. He was a good guy. That cop was a good guy. He really was a genuine uh, good cop. You know, he didn't want to bother nobody. That guy just came in. He wanted to put the hours in and go home, you know. But, uh, no, I never liked cops growing up. i tell you the truth, seriously. And my cousin Teddy is actually, uh, you know, he, he was a cop. I know Teddy. I worked with Teddy. Yeah, you know, my uh, cousin Teddy, uh, his father, my father, uh, where cousins through because uh, they have the same mother, but they have different fathers, you know. But one day maybe we'll get them on and we could uh, discuss, uh, you know, our heritage and stuff like that. But it's pretty cool, you know. Absolutely, <laughs> guys. We're at we're at an hour and two minutes. Mike, I'm going to give you uh, your last words. You got anything to plug? Anything else you want to talk about? Well, I just want to first of all, I want to thank you guys for having me, and I, you know, thank Jimmy again for having me last week. Um, you know, being able to talk about this book and being able to talk about Luigi, because I, to tell you the truth, guys, and you know, we've been on for an hour. I haven't even scratched the surface yet in terms of all of the things that this guy did and what he told me. And it's all in the book. So I'm, I'm going to urge your listeners and your viewers to to get it. I think you'll really like it. It's a fast read from what I'm told. And um, and I, I think you'll it, it, it gives you, uh, you know, a, a peek into a world that um, that a, a true peek into a world that's not Hollywood. You know, it's, uh, it's not Hollywood created. It's, uh, it's, it's something that, um, that not many people have uh, experienced. And, uh, and, and I think it's a, it's an enjoyable, uh, it, it, it'd be an enjoyable story, particularly if you like this genre. And, uh, and I'm going to plug one other thing, guys, if you don't mind, I have a new book coming out at the end of the end of around the end of November called fallen angel. And it's my first attempt at a novel. And I call it a true crime fantasy. And the reason I do that is because the crimes that are in the book, that part of this four, five, four or five stories that are part of, the, of this, this, this life of a prosecutor and um, are all cases that are my cases. So I didn't make up the stories. I didn't make up the crimes. They're, they're true crimes. I kind of enhanced them a little bit to kind of fit the you know, the, uh, the theme of the, of the book. And the theme is basically that the crime was out of control in Brooklyn because the devil, the evil devil, the evil one is basically instigating the crimes to basically destroy the fabric of life in Brooklyn. And they, and a prosecutor is hired by a government organization 
to to do battle. And that's that's the sense this the uh, the underlying uh, 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 premise Starting of the book. So um, I didn't I was told by my publisher that um, don't end it. Don't end the story after book one. So I didn't because I'm writing book two right now. And then there's going to be a, a book three. So hopefully by the end of that, the prosecutor will have driven the devil out of Brooklyn and maybe he'll go to, uh, you know, Chicago next. But he seems like he's in Chicago right now with their crime wave. So yeah, uh, absolutely. that's that's it. So thank you for allowing me to to plug both of the books. And uh, and as usual, this is this is great. And Jimmy, Looking forward to it. Jimmy Calandra, uh, final words, how many books you got coming out? Well, you know, I, I, I want to focus on uh, one right now, but uh, <laughs> I would love to drop a book soon. You know, I have a lot of things written down, but, uh, you know, we'll see what happens in the future. Hopefully something good, some good ventures and thing. But, you know, thank you guys for having me tonight. I'm going to have uh, Bill. I'm going to be praying for your mom. OK, so, uh, you know, just to let you know. And uh, you. you guys, uh, you know, listen, hey, have a great night. Mike, this book is uh, fantastic. The uh, photos in there, the way you wrote this book, I'm telling you, listen, you guys got to go out there. You got to pick up this book. I'm telling you, listen, you're going to love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, final words. Final words. Yes, Mike, uh, you did only scratch the surface on this book. There's so many intricate details about how Luigi uh, made his way into organized crime in Sicily and then had a, a heroin connection coming to the United States. That that's how they brought him over for, to do enforcement and all the things he did while he was here. And you talk about the one homicide that he did for himself. Not going to go too far into it. You got to read the book, right. guys. Very, very interesting, great book, and you're getting it from a career Brooklyn prosecutor. There's no better than Mike in the Brooklyn DA's office. Uh, tried some of the biggest cases. Uh, really professional. Uh, good luck with the writing, Mike. We know that you got several books out, and you're working on those other two or three. God bless. Thanks for coming on. Jimmy, you as well. Glad you. you're still sending out the positive message, Jimmy. Uh, the streets will never let you back. That's a great statement. I love that you coined that phrase. It's the truth. And uh, just a continued su success for both of our uh, guests tonight. Thank you both for coming on. And God bless everybody out there, all our subscribers and our listeners. Keep giving us that thumbs up. Jimmy's got a great podcast. If you want to check him, check him out, subscribe to him. Give him the thumbs up as well. Folks, that's the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening. On behalf of myself and Phil Grimaldi and our two guests, Jimmy Calandra and Michael Vecchioni, have a great night and God bless. Stay safe, everyone. Thank bless. you, guys. Have a good one. One episode, just ain't enough.